Right, I think it's about 30 seconds before the hour of 8 o'clock and it's a Puza Thursday and we are puzzling some uh, apple juice today looking after my skin uh, trying to lay off the hard stuff but uh, if you're gonna Puza, it's up to you it's Puza Thursday man in South Africa welcome to it it's the late night report with me KC Caro Andre Pantinard and Peter joins us Aha. Mervyn Naidu from the Fives in Chatsworth. Vishal Rampasad joins us from uh, other side of town. Rosebud Kettle is on. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Let's log on. It's been a warm, actually, it's been a fucking hot day today. Uh, really, really hot. And then the weather has changed in the afternoon. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to it. Uh, all set for another jam packed hour or so. We've got a wonderful guest waiting in the wings there, backstage to get on. So uh, log in. If you're new, come on, come on and say hi. Just say hello, good evening, and where in the world you are watching from? South Africa, Africa, around the world. Log on and say hi. I know you're watching. So uh, let's join the family. <laughs> Natalie, what up, what up, what up? Have you got that ink like a set text? Ideal says 40 degrees in now spread. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's not load shedding and I can't see this video. Is load shedding still carrying on? I thought it stopped. Yes, there's no load shedding. Who's having load shedding? Maybe I'm gonna have load shedding. I don't think so. Let me just check quickly. Load shedding is suspended. Who's having load shedding? Uh, right, good evening, everyone. Let's uh, run that down. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening and welcome to it. Let me just get reset here. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Who's having load shedding? Load shedding is suspended. Why are they load shedding you? What damage did you do and why? Why are they picking on you? <laughs> Um, ideal says load shedding is off. Yes, load shedding is suspended, man. So if somebody's cutting your power, it's not ESCOM. Your landlord or somebody doesn't like you. Welcome to it, guys. Let's get straight into it. Firstly, uh, other than being a freaking hot day, this afternoon's show on the midday report, I discussed an important matter. Some people heard about it in Chatsworth. The Taxi Association, according to the article in the tabloid newspaper, were stopping uh, lift clubs, lift clubs, you know, your lift clubs, you're picking up people, taking them to work. Um, that was causing some drama. Today, I spoke to Bashir Ismail, the PRO for the Chatsworth Taxi Association. Now, he made it clear that um, they were only um, targeting those seven seaters and gray taxis that were operating and stealing business from the taxi association. And I think that's acceptable. However, there were allegations of them stopping passenger vehicles, checking on them, questioning them, and all of that. The uh, Metro Police state clearly that nobody is allowed to stop motorists, question them, or anything of the sort. However, Bashir Ismail of the Chatsworth Taxi said quite categorically that that is not what they are doing, and they've never done that. Some people contacted me and, and contested that. By that time, the interview was over. But listen, they're not allowed to do that. If they do that, they're not allowed to do that. If you find somebody uh, in plain clothes trying to flag you down and stop your vehicle, you have every right not to stop or listen to such people, only law enforcement officers. I understand where the Taxi Association is coming from in certain ways, but of course, they can't interfere with you as a motorist. Now, also, he picked on stuff like that. Picked on, he mentioned that if you are taking people to work and getting paid for it, then you must make a certain application and you must be legal and all of that. Well, you can decide you want to be legal or get it done the right way if that happens. However, I said to him, surely you're not going to go tackle these people and worry them. It's been happening for years. People are earning a living. And in these pandemic times, you shouldn't be denying somebody an income in that sense. He was quite clear that that's not what they were going to do. And uh, the taxi association is concentrating on the seven-seater vehicles and the... Um, Great taxis. Uh, oh, yeah, let me see in Good evening, everybody. Welcome to it. 
Uh, we have a special guest. This guy has been on my platform, and I know he's listening to me now. Originally, I thought he was a troll, like he was trolling me. And when the trolls were on during the unrest, the trolls were coming and uh, just attacking me. And then, then I started watching his platform. And I remember I kept trying to say his, saying his name. I don't know if I still got it right. Malolenja. I think I already right. Malolenja uh, is his nickname, I think. We're going to find that out about him. So he's been on my platform for quite a while. Uh, yesterday, he commented quite a bit. And then I said, hey, let's get all of him. Let's bring him on the platform. Let's hear what he has to say. And yeah, so without much further ado, let's bring Madolenja onto the platform. Good afternoon, sir. Good evening, uh, Casey, and uh, good evening to the viewer, to the viewers. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Right, I think you just need to speak up a bit louder. I can hardly hear you. Pick up your volume or speak closer okay. to the mic. Right, okay. Can you hear me uh, now? Good, good, good evening, Casey. Good evening to the viewers. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Right, firstly. Give me the uh, right name, Madolenja. Did I get that right? Because I kept saying it on the platform, Madolenja, Madolenja. That's, that's correct. Look, that is my nickname. You know when yeah. you grow up sometimes, you, you like to say things to people and then they call you that. So that's how it came about. So I've been using it on the, on the Facebook. Uh, what, look, what does Madolenja yeah. mean? What did you say? Okay. Madolenja means, you know a dog. You know that it's dog knees. So when, I'm, when I used to look the dog knees, the knees. Oh, of dog. The dog. Knees. knees of the dog. Yes, yes, yes. That's <laughs> how, you see, when you used to pick uh, on each other as, 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 as guys, so that's how I used to pick on them. So they say, okay, because they like this term, then they, they give it to me and then I accept it. So that's how it became my nickname. <laughs> All yeah. right, thanks. Thanks for, for that. And I kept trying to say your name because... For some reason, I like to get people's names right. Like, I don't like to get the names wrong. I like to say it the way it's supposed to say. I think it's got um, it's, it's respect, like trying to say your name correctly. Um, so um, I, I think even, I'll be honest with you, uh, and I don't approve of that, um, uh, in the townships or in our townships, when, when black workers come to, and this happened to Indian people as well with whites, when yeah. the white man couldn't pronounce the name, he gave him the name Bobby. His name is Pregasin Sivasami. Let's call you Bobby. That's why there are so many Bobbies in the Indian community because the white man, and that is actually disrespectful. But the same thing happens in, in our community with black people. And I must be honest, I've done the same in the past. When I can't say the, the black guy's name, I give him a name, short form or some other name, but it's still wrong. It's, it's, not, it's not right. But I, I admit I've done it in the past as well. And then I learned from it. Now, everywhere I go, I like to say your name. What is your name? What is your name? I like to say your name. Um, so to me, that's respect and or, or trying to be respectful. You agree, sir? No, no, absolutely. I agree. I agree. I agree. Right. So how long have you been uh, following me uh, and, and watching my platform and why? What drew you to my platform? Since when? Yeah. Okay. Let me be honest, uh, Casey. You see, uh, I'm, I'm fairly new in your platform. I think it started around those times where there was this looting and this whole chaos that was happening in, in July. And firstly, look, I didn't really understand the platform. I'll be very honest. I didn't, I didn't understand. In my mind, I thought it's a group that just uh, came as a result of this whole mayhem. And of course, during that time, emotions were high and, uh, you know, the country was in a terrible state, so to speak. So uh, as a result of that, Many people were having comments which are a bit uh, overstretched, so to speak. So I, I think I do understand that why you thought hey, this character probably must be a troll, you know, because I, I, I did have some exchanges of some rough words with some few individuals. But, you know, after some time, once I got closer to the group and I paid uh, attention, I've realized that, you know what, this thing is not what I think it is. The purpose and the objective of this group is not really what I thought it was. As I kept on listening to you and listening to all the initiatives that you are involved in, obviously not alone with some other uh, members as well. So that's how I, that, that's what drew me even closer and closer to the group. Hence, I'm following and I'm listening. No, wow, but the, the good thing about that is originally you were exchanging some bad words, not bad, but you were, you were engaging and you thought, you thought something else about it. But still, you kept on watching, like you see, until you until you realize that hey, man, this group is because I'll be honest with you, 
sometimes I talk things that people don't understand, like it's a bit beyond them, like the, the mindset of thinking on another level. And then the guy who can't understand it says, ah, this guy is a bullshit, he doesn't know anything. Because his mind is not thinking beyond that little past his nose. And then obviously you sort of saw that, what I was trying to say, the things that I was outputting myself out there. Yes, that's correct, that's correct. So I like to talk things like that. And I like to think I have a, I have an intelligent audience. They must be able to think on other levels, look at things in a different way. And that's how we grow and expand our mind. So thanks for following. Thanks for watching. It's uh, Madolenja and uh, Kosanati Kanyesile. Kanyile. Kanyile. Correct. And where were you born and brought up your Zulu, Kosa? Yes, yes, I am a Zulu. Look, uh, I trace my origins back in Nganja, but I was born in Mlazi. Well, my father, he grew up in Nganja. Nganja. I was born in Mlazi Township. That's where I grew up. And uh, yeah. But I'm no longer so staying there now. I've moved. So you got roots in Kandla? No, no. I Look, I, I, I was born in Umlaz. But I'm saying, you know us as African people, we always trace our origins back in the farm. Not where we stay or where we grew up. Yeah. But I was born in Umlaz. But I'm just saying that my father grew up in Nganda. So us as African people, if, if, if someone asks you, where is your home? You generally tell them your farm before you tell them where, where you are staying. Yes, okay. So what, what, what I'm saying is your father was born in Kandla. So maybe yeah. you got some land there. We can go stay there near Zuma, whatever. Ah, I not really, not really. Yeah. I but now I stay in Pine Town. I've moved from Mlazi. I stay in Pine Town. <laughs> right, no more can't I move to Pine Town. Right. Yeah, so yeah. let give me your version on the unrest where you were staying. What happened? What went through your mind? This philosophy, just you can just talk. What? July 12th, what it meant to you, what you saw happening, what you didn't like, what you liked. Just just air your air your just air yourself. Okay, correct. Look, uh Casey, it was a very difficult moment, I must say. Very difficult moment, uh, as we could all see that in the entire province and even in Gauteng too. This unrest uh, caused a lot of chaos. Our lives were very difficult. Uh here in Pine Town, what you what what happened is that. There were a lot of uh, people who, I would call it CPFs or and all these groups, who were like protecting our like, look, our shops and all of that. Yes, in in, in, the, in the CPD, like in Pine Town, there was some damage that happened. But in the inner suburbs where we stay, look, we we protected our our facilities. So, but look, it, it, it was a very painful moment, and we do not want to see that happening in the future. Yeah. So, in, so our, sure. our president said that they were caught with their pants down, that they didn't expect this to happen. Your version on that, were they caught with their pants down or they knew what was happening and just decided to pack down? No, look, that's very true. You see, based on how I look at this thing, this whole thing is, the, is an internal battle of the ANC. As you all know that there are camps and factions within the ANC. So maybe the current a faction that is in power did not actually realize or they didn't okay maybe they undermined the gravity of what could potentially happen as a, as a result they did not take or put relevant or necessary measures in place to keep or to prevent this thing they they downgraded it and when it happened it affected all of us so it was it was a very 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 sad moment it was a very sad moment yeah, indeed, it was a sad moment for South Africa as a whole to watch those images, watch those things happening on the screen. And uh, do you have any family members in those areas, people who are part of it or people who are not part of it? Do you have any people in those informal settlements who are telling you something that they weren't part of it, that they were part of it? Anybody, any, any, or why they did it? Look, I'll put it this way. Like me and where I am and people who are surrounding me, I, I've never seen that. But of course, we know people from the townships and from other areas, even right here in Pine Town. When I, when I was driving to go and look for bread in the township to buy bread, because bread was dead around and you could not find it yet, I could see people on the streets carrying trolleys with all of those things. And the, the sad thing is that it was not necessarily or strictly poor people who were, who were actively involved in this thing. I've seen cars, like your double cabs, your Mercedes, participating in this thing. <laughs> okay, like right. I've seen it with my eyes. Yeah. Wow. 
So yeah. that's a. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Madolenja here, right? So yeah, I'm gonna address this right up front here, right? And I knew this was going yeah. to happen, and I think maybe you would have known this was going to happen. Um, we have a we have somebody who wants to tackle you, and that's a black guy. And Kuroleko is saying to you, "You are not listening, my friend. You're jumping the gun. Must leave Zuma out of this and listen carefully." So he's telling you that you're not listening and you're not answering the question properly. Um, but I've seen this before. Whenever a black guy comes on or a black lady comes on and shares a different opinion, there's almost always somebody, another black guy will come out and call you out for being either stupid, you don't know what you're talking about, something is wrong with you. Have you experienced okay. that? Do you want to do you want to address this guy? Of course, of course, it's fine. Let me address him. Okay, let me wear the cap he's giving to me, but let me ask him the question. In his own interpretation or explanation, what was the cause of this riot? How does he understand it? Why did it happen? I don't know if you can because, answer that question. Because we all saw the posters on the first day or the day before free Zuma, free Zuma. That was the that's where it all started. And then it went south yeah. after. But, anyways, um, we addressed him and we leave him. The beauty part, <laughs> the beauty part of these guys, they're watching all the time. When there's good points, they won't agree. When there's something they don't agree with, then they want to climb in and tell you something, tell you off. But they're watching everything else. Hence, hence it will be nice to hear their version. What is their interpretation of those events? Maybe they can educate us. They can tell us better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe they must tell us something we don't know. Exactly. That they won't get caught with our pants down. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but what I was interested in is, and you know, in this whole matter, what you've been following me, and you, if you follow me for the Andres, you see I was very passionate, I was very upset at times that my entire community was being labeled uh, as racist. This whole racist drama started to come to the fore. And I was pretty upset about it, um, as, as you would have seen. And of course, the Indian community was taken to task. Then the guys came out and spoke about how they're abused by Indians. Uh, how they don't look up, look uh, ill treat black people. Then, of course, Julius Malema was on the scene. And PK. So the Indians were being torn left, right, and center. Right. So it was important for me to know that your story, which you're going to share with us, I don't know the entire story, but okay. surely there are, I won't say there are bad incidents. I won't say that. Employer, employee is going to happen whether it's black and white, white and black, black and Indian. You want to comment on that? Am I right? Will that happen across the board? No, no, correct, correct. Uh, maybe let me first start with this uh, Phoenix issue. Look, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, Casey. Uh, first of all, there's no one that I know who stays there or maybe who's been a victim. Of course, I know they, they are victims, but I don't know of any. Okay, the point I'm trying to make is that there's no one that I've got like personal uh, interaction with to, to hear direct from the horse's mouth the version of the events. All these things we well, look, I hear or I learn of them from the social media. You understand? So, therefore, that makes me not being so privy to the details. Because, look, media is media. You cannot 100% or entirely rely on the information that you draw from the media. And this matter is now before the courts. So, let the law take its course. Let the process unfold. But having said that, justice must be seen to be done. Because the law of the country, as we've always uh, put it out, and it's, it's not Casey who's putting it out, but it's, it's the law of the country. One is innocent until proven guilty. I will say this, because if our political leaders are somehow involved in Casey, that can't always come out. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and the uh, sword must be sharp on both sides. So this issue, let the process unfold, because as, as the general public, let's face it, I'm not a, a, a trained or a competent court of law. Let's leave that to the, to the law to take its course, to roll out proper processes. But in that process, justice must be done. That's all I'm saying. Yes, because interestingly today, or you will, I think it's in Nelspreet Court, there's an ANC guy who's charged for murder. I don't know the whole story. But somebody from the ANC is a spokesperson says, well, yes, he's in court, but justice must take its route and innocent, straight away they say, innocent until proven guilty, that's good for them. But when these guys are in prison now, they must rot in jail. They must be full might of the law 
But the innocent until proven guilty, they're not talking about it. But when it's one of their own, then it's innocent until proven guilty. So, you know, it's uh, different yeah. strokes for different folks. But very interestingly, yeah. you spoke about, and I'm glad you picked on that or, or mentioned that, that, and in a way, I don't blame the people for getting upset because they were being fed false information. I think 70% of the information was false. The videos were from other areas, whatever was being shared. I mean, even me, if you're sharing me information about a township where Indians are being attacked, I'll get upset. But what is happening here? Why are the but wrong information? That is why also when I get videos, people send me something like recently they were sharing videos about the EFF marching in Gateway, right? I got about two or three videos. I looked at these videos. I said, "How, man? I was a Gateway a couple of hours ago. When this happened?" So no, it happened in the morning. But they were sharing old videos of the EFF marching and. The EFF was in Gateway in a small number, but they were sharing the old videos about the EFF marching in the streets at how man. Now you see our social media, they just share anything, and we on the other end start to believe that this shit happened. No, no, I, I agree. I agree. I hear you. I yeah, hear so Madalenja, what I want you to share with us is so what I was saying is the Indians, and uh, I've always heard this thing about Indian employers ill-treating black people. Look, it happens. We know that, right? But it's not like it defines all of us. So you had a good story that you were trying to share with me that you had, like how Judge, our acting Chief Justice Judge Zondo had a, such a wonderful story of how an Indian guy helped him. And by the way, there are many such stories, but of course, the stories are not being told. The good stories don't get told. But you on the other hand have a good story, which I, was, I listened to part of it, then I'm going to allow you to give me your, your story about your upbringing and, and your college days and how you started to have interaction. So the stage is yours. I'll interject every now and then. Let us hear yeah. that story. Okay, good, Casey. Look, I, I, I'm glad that you've touched base on both sides of the coin in terms of being treated good and bad. Because, look, we can't shy away from the fact that not, not specifically or, well, yeah, not specifically to the Indian group per se. It could be white employer, it could be an Indian employer, it could be a black employer and so on. Because these things, happens across the spectrum. Let's face it, it's a fact. But uh, look, as I've interacted with you, I felt the need to just to share with you this, these things because it's very, okay, people tend to, okay, people get very tempted to generalize. And I always say to generalize is wrong, it's, it's not right. Because in every sector of our community, be it Africans, be it Indians, be it black, be it white, you, know, you always get good and people are not so good. Across, across the board. It's not an Indian thing, it's not a, a black African thing, it's not a white thing, but across the spectrum. So maybe to share a little bit my story. Uh, when I started, like in my career, first of all, I'll start from a tertiary institution. I went to, to MUT, it, now it's known as MUT, Mangosuji University of Technology, when I started. Back then it used to be known as Mangosuji Technicon. Okay, I enrolled, anyway, I was not, I was not coming from a a wealthy background. I was coming from a struggling background. I've enrolled in the in the in the in the technical in the township there. I've done my first year. Well, look, my results were not that bad. I did very well, I must say. And the the HOD, the head of the department in my faculty, who happened to be an Indian uh, guy, his name is Ravi Ravi Chetty. Uh, okay, I released my results next year. Next year, January, it was. During December time, so, when, when so uh, Ravi Ravi Chetty was the head of your your faculty there. Yes, he was the HOD. What what were you studying? It's construction management and quantity surveying. Construction management, okay, right? Yes, yeah. So okay, I, I didn't uh, release my result on the same day after writing the exams because there were no funds at home. But I've managed to hustle during the holidays until next year January. Then I was able to pay the technical and I got my result. Well, my result was so impressive. The HOD, because I, I used to talk to him, you know, because of my behavior in class and things that I used to do. So I showed him, hey, he was so impressed. He said, you know what? He called me to his office. He said, sit down. I'm so impressed about the results. He picked the phone. He phoned, he phoned one of the, well, I, I would say his friends or colleagues, but he, the, the colleague he was phoning was owning a, a, a private practice, a quantity surveying firm of something that I'm studying for. He told him, you know what, look, I've got one student, he, he, he has done so well, so 
I would really not like to see this guy sitting at home. Please yeah, give him some in-service training there. And straight away, that happened. Is one Indian HOF of mine talking to a director who's also in India. That's so he, took, so he, took, he saw you as a so he saw you as a good student, didn't want you to be left without a job, called up his friend and arranged a in-service uh, training for you. Correct. That is step number. And it's and it, it, it wasn't his job to do that. He didn't, he didn't need to do it. That is the, exactly the point where I was trying to get at that. Look, one may say, ah, but, but at the end of the day, it was out of the goodness of his heart uh, without seeing any uh, color or any differences between myself and him. All he saw was married. And then he acted on that. Out of the goodness of his heart, in other words, he went an extra mile. He did more than what he was supposed to do, which we need to understand and accept. Okay. Moving on to the next, okay, uh, well, I was placed there. I, I did what I was supposed to do. The ATA was finished, and I was given tasks. Look, there is this, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say it's a perception, but there is this common thing that I keep on hearing. I can't deny it or agree to it, but all I can say is that I've never experienced it. Because, you see, uh, mostly from the black colleagues that I interact with quite often, if, if they work, in a predominantly, well, not black, maybe Indian or white and, and so on, they tend to say, you know what, the type or the nature of assignment that we are given, you can actually see that they are not equal. Look, we get the easiest assignment and then the other minority groups that they get given like decent or challenging or bigger assignment. Look, in my engagement or during my employ, they have never experienced it, I must say. I've never experienced that. I was told in a deep end and I was taught properly how to do what I was going to be trained to do. Okay, fair enough. Let's go past that. I went back to the institution. I've done my third day. I've finished. Immediately when I finished, because so you did, I worked uh, well. You did, you did, sorry, you did in-service and then you went back yes. to the institution for third year. Correct. Yes, correct. To finish right. uh, my diploma. So the day I dropped the pen when I finished my last exam, I picked up the phone. I phoned one of the directors there. Because I did my interview training, I explained to him, look, I'm done now with my exams. What have you got for me? He said, hey, like it. Come here next week, Monday. I came there. He gave me a desk. Start. Carry on. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. yeah. So when I was there, again, just like what I've said before, it's not like I was given maybe some assignments that are out there in the periphery. I was also given like proper assignments and I was taught properly. How to do the job but of course as a, as a young professional or as a young graduate as you carry on you opportunities are out there so after two and a half years or so i spotted an opportunity in a, in a, in a, in a soe which was paying double my salary and i progressed that like, just like anyone else could do but until today we still have that interaction we and i still appreciate what the, what i've learned from there so it, overall the point that i'm trying to make by appearing in this in, in your platform is that to generalize is wrong you it's you can't paint people with one brush so that's that's where i stand with this whole matter no I, and that's a good news story because we only hear the you hear of the abuse but i want to take your story maybe i like the indian black story right that the right. indian guy of the black guy but in actual fact it was a human being helping a human being you had merit you weren't a black guy looking for favors. You didn't even ask for the favor. You studied. You had merit. You went on merit. And the company that hired you wouldn't have bothered you if you didn't have some skill because they're paying you a salary. They're not doing you a favor. So obviously in your internship, they saw that you had potential. Hence, no problem. Come to work. So they didn't employ a black guy. They employed a qualified guy to do the job. No, I, I, hear, I hear you, Casey. I agree, I agree. But you see, what I wanted to point out is that, just like how we discussed before, that more especially the HOT, he had no obligation to do that. You understand? So the point is, uh, maybe if, if, if he had an issue that I'm an African guy, he can't assist, he would have looked the other way. That's the point. No, 100%. And sometimes, you know, and why yours is such a good story as well, and why that HOD should be even more commended because underlying things like, for example, in the Indian community, 
because of what's happened recently and happened in the past, where it's skewed towards the black community, a lot of Indians want to have Indian solidarity and employ Indian people first. If you know, you understand that that must be a mentality. It must. You can't deny it. it happens in the black community as well, right? So this guy didn't see any of those things that he must go for Indians first or push Indians. He just saw him. That's what makes it even more astounding, great, and speaks about that guy. It was just a, a great decision he made. Correct. 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 Which until so today, now you're on your way. Sure. Now you're on. What are, what are you qualified at now? What are you, what are you qualified at? I'm a Tell me something before before you. Before you uh, before you answer any of the questions, before you decided to study what you wanted to study, were they offering any courses on uh, tenderpreneurs and corruption? <laughs> hey, we, no, not at all. Look, that is the problem that we are facing as professionals who are trained in, in that particular field. Uh, this whole thing, this whole construction industry, if I put it that way, is seen as a draft where things are happening. And every Tom Dick and Harry enters there. And it, 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 politicians are putting their fingers there. I, I will say this unashamed. Politicians are putting their fingers there. They don't want to properly regulate our industry because they see if they do so, uh, they will phase themselves out of the trap. I think a lot of people I know who've made a lot of money are involved in construction. So is that is that why there's so much there's, there's money in construction? There's major a lot of guys I know got big money there in construction. Look. <laughs> it, it depends. If if you are doing well, there is. But it's easy to take wrong decisions, and you can you can bend your fingers. No, these guys were in construction. Started ten years ago, they were something else. Suddenly, they became construction engineers or construction guys because maybe they were getting the work, something coming their way, and they become. Then they're building roads. Originally, yeah, they were right. doing something else. Suddenly, they're building roads. Correct. That's very true. You see, the problem is. Uh, in, in this construction industry, there are two sides. It's either you become a consultant or you become a contractor. A contractor is like a builder. For you to become a contractor, there is no specific, uh, how can I call it, like a qualification or so to speak. You, you can just register your company and then you, you register with all these relevant statutory bodies such as your CIDB, and then you can start tendering. Quite often, and I will say this unashamedly because I don't care who says what. Quite often, you see people who come like that, it's either they've got a contract here, if not there. Some are politically affiliated. So they they get things. And you find people who are properly trained and, and experienced and so on, they are not that lucky. Particularly if they don't uh, have the correct <laughs> contract. Madalena, I'm going to take you back to your... Uh, obviously, to get into technical and whatever, you had a, an education to get you in. What is your schooling education like? studying obviously you you wanted to, to to progress you got good results in school but what was school like was it easy difficult to get the results were you did your parents push you into it how are you motivated look uh okay first of all we had, we had it that way i i i started in the township not this thing of uh, going to this uh multiracial school and so on i never had that privilege or access so look i had to pull through struggle and look eventually i made it that, how, that much I can say. I used to go to the township school. That's how I studied from the township until I finished my matric in the township. I happened to pass because, look, I, I did not grow up in a family where there is a lot of, how can I put it? I grew up in a good family, so to speak, but we are not wealthy, but we are a good family in terms of principles and values. So that's how well, I managed said, to put through. So that's also, that's also very important in growing uh, good children and Good children, good people mean good societies, good communities, good countries. It starts from there. For example, you, as you said, you may not have been rich or affluent, but you had a good family structure that made sure you got educated. Correct. Absolutely. And that's and you're seeing the results now. And of course, you will pass the same thing on to your kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that's how that's tell me something. I've got another view on this, and I'll tell you. And and I'm glad you mentioned early on about. You didn't. You got the hard jobs, and you and it made you a better person for getting the hard jobs. You didn't give it easy jobs at your company. Oh. What do you think of the current schooling career and curriculum by just passing students thirty percent, letting them go through the system, going to university with under under qualifications? Is that does that really build South Africa? Is it helping us? Is it 
going to produce better engineers, better doctors. I, what do you think of that? Look, Casey, let me, let me be brutally honest about issues here. You see, here in South Africa, we are not a, a poor country, if I may put it that way. Start looking up in Africa. You're looking at your Zimbabwe, you look at your Mozambique, you look at all the other countries, maybe even up, up to Nigeria. Fair enough, they may not have the resources that we have. Maybe their countries may be poor, but look at the quality of their education. I'll give you a typical example right now. You see, here in South Africa, where when we are looking for artisans or we are looking for people who, who at least know what they are doing, you can see for yourself, you get guys from Mozambique who come and, and, and do the job. Why? Because they've got the basics right. They were trained properly. They were given proper education. Yes, their countries are poor. So our country uh, is not, well, look, particularly now, we have not invested enough in education. And the quality of our education, you can see for yourself. I've got nothing more to say, but you can see for yourself. The quality, I will start with a very simple example, the quality of artisans, you can see from there. So. Because surely even in your industry, you will see people coming in as uh, learners or internship and you yourself can figure out hell man you don't know what you should be knowing are you not also experiencing that with, with uh, what's coming in now from from the from the from the uh, institutions look it, it does happen casey but okay maybe let me put it this way not so much with those with uh, like tertiary education or higher education but i've seen that so i'm seeing that quite often with the artisans I don't know whether probably it's is it because the, the universities have got that component of being private. Because for argument's sake, you find that uh, our high school learners will make it to high school level. But the minute they start entering the university, they battle completely. Because I guess the university, they structure their own curriculum and then they've got, they've got this element of being private. So I'm not seeing much from that sector, but from the artisans, what I see, hey. Yeah, it's... And and, yeah. and and by the way, I'm surprised, I'm not glad but when you spoke about that you'd get a guy from Mozambique because he has a better skill set or whatever. And and when we and, and I was saying this, like if I'm employing a guy um, on the street, take a scab laborer, right? And they say employ South Africans. But I will almost inherently go towards the Mozambique guy or the Zimbabwean guy because his work ethic and his knowledge is, is much greater so i'm the i'm the guy who's hiring and i want a job done and i'm looking for the best guy you know we want to employ the south african guy but this guy is giving me a better skill set and people want to shoot me down for that no you shouldn't be doing that but i'm the one paying the money i want my work done exactly and and number two people must realize that these are not personal issues it's not a personal matter why would you all of a sudden just not like the South African boss simply because he's a, he's a South African. I mean, it doesn't make sense. The only reason why you opt for this guy is because at least you see value. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, Katie, but that's how I look at it. No, that's what it is. We, we see the value in the work. You see the value in the work ethic, in the way they want to work. And I'm going to share this with you, right? And by the way, I got a guy. So I'm going to share something like personal. I got a black guy I brought down from Johannesburg. He was working in our business. He's now we brought him down living with us, right? And I'm going to share this with you, and, and I know you're going to understand it, because if I say it on other platforms, ah, you're a racist, you're a this, you're a that, you know, all, it just the mindset is different. I get so upset when I'm using him as an example, right? He's a black guy. He had nothing. They're living in a shack. Brought him down, living in my... I treat him well, but he doesn't know how to handle good... He always does something that's he wants to steal something, doesn't want to work, wants to wake up late. And I always got to be motivating him. I said, why do I need to tell you this every day? Get up and do the best job you can do. No, today it's too hot. Then he gets, now he's got a stomach pain. Then you, you can see that like the laziness creeping in, not wanting to be too productive. And I said to him, I said, this is the downfall. And by the way, in my past 20 years of employing people, He's not the first person and not the only example. I can name you numerous examples. When, when I bring people in, want to teach them, want the, 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 the willingness to learn and grasp and be is just 
And it disappoints me because I'm giving him an opportunity that he didn't have. I'm giving him a chance to learn, to do something. But he doesn't want to grasp it. He doesn't want to say, yes, I need to. And, and that's what. So he's going to stay in that same place. He won't realize it five years later, 10 years. He's still in that same space and he hasn't moved anywhere. And right. You see, Casey, what I think is an issue is a problem right there. I think, I think we've got a wrong culture. If I'm, if I'm saying culture, I'm not saying, uh, how can I put it? Maybe we are, we are raised wrong or something like that. But I think the government somehow needs to reduce this uh, free, this free debt and entitlement mentality. Look, I'm, I'm not painting everyone with the same brush. There, we do have good people. You know what I'm saying? We do have good, dedicated guys and so on. But I think the, the whole mindset and the culture that is being entrenched to the people needs to change a little bit. I'll give you a typical example. Uh, when I read, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, or anyone in the platform can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. I've, I've heard that, by the way, in South Africa, we are the only country that gives people free housing. Mind you, we are not the first world country. So those type of things are the things that make people don't want to work. Or it creates some sort of entitlement mentality, which we need to do away with. You know, it's refreshing to but, hear from you as, as, as a black person speak that. And of course, you're going to get chastised for it and some people will come after correct. you. You know that. Yeah. But we've, we've been saying this, but when we say it, like I say, me, my friends, or the Indian community, or the white community say it, then straight away we are racist. We don't understand. But you see, as you experienced, when the company took you, if they gave you all the small jobs, you would never have grown as a person to, to, to fully appreciate things and be be a better person. So now when, when, you, when, you, when, when this government is giving, like you said, everything for free, electricity is for free, water is for free, live for free, don't worry, we'll provide. Even now the government is saying we will give you things, free electricity is coming. So when you have things for free, you know this, and I think if your kids even, you're not just going to feed them stuff. You need to teach them the value of the 10 rand or the 20 rand. Like if you buy a kid a nice tacky, you take it and run in the mud. You're going to be upset. You're going to have a talk oh. to him and say, listen, 700 rand, 400 rand, what are you doing? So if they don't understand the value, then they're not going to appreciate it. And, we, and we're stuck in the cycle. It's just, it, and it, and for someone like me who wants to build, help build the country and help build, by the way, to help build, build the black community, this whole thing of entitlement and give, is not helping the black community at all. It's not doing them Absolutely. any favors. Correct. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm not happy about. But, when, but when, we, when we talk the language, when we sing the song about entitlement, no. Then we are the racist, we are whatever. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes we talk things people don't even understand. Uh, the level of we're talking about. I am actually wanting the best for you. I'm, I want something to be to, that you must. You must. You know I, what I like something about my community is that um, sometimes we say it in a bad way. Like if there's a guy working for a plumber, right? Yeah. And he's a tool boy, just passing the tools. Yeah. Within two years, he's running his own plumbing company because he learned how to pass the yeah. tools. He learned how right. to do the tap. He learned how to do this. He learned how to do that. Now he's running his own plumbing. He left that guy. He's running his own company. Correct. And you see, Casey, the, mm -hmm, okay. Karen, Karen. Oh, okay. I'm saying the, the trick here is you see, currently people are being given fish, but they are not being taught how to fish. That's where that's where this whole thing. I think that that's where we lose it. Teach the man how to fish, then he can feed himself forever. You give him fish now, he's gonna come back for another fish tomorrow. As simple as that. 100%. You know, like I said, also when I was employing people and uh, if I employed a guy to clean my, or to come work somewhere in my company or whatever, right? So I said, your job is to put this bag in that place, they'll feed that machine. So yeah. while that's happening, the next day I said to him, okay, just come and do this here. He says, no, no, no. I was employed to do this. So I can't do that. So there's two things at play here. Someone will come, the union will come and tell you, you are putting other work on him. It's not in his work schedule, whatever. But here's the other thing. If you go and do that job there, you are learning another skill. Correct, 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 correct. But I think the unions themselves are, are, are the worst enemies of the employees when they tell them you're only allowed to do that. Yes, we know it opens it up for a bit of, uh, what can I say, uh, abuse of the worker. 
But I, I, I always believe that if you learn something else, you learn a new skill. And I, and I told my employees that when I worked for a company, I said, when the time comes for retrenchment or something happens, the employee will say, oh, this guy knows that job and that job and this job. This guy only knows this job. Who's going to go first? Who are you going to look for first? And but furthermore, that's furthermore, it's for your own personal development. At the end of the day, people don't yeah. look at it that way. They all, they, what they look at is being abused by the employer, giving me what he's not paying me for. But at the end of the day, uh, it's, your, it's for your own personal development. Because yeah. should that employment not be there tomorrow, at least you've got two or three options. You've got one or two things that you can actually utilize to, to feed your family or, or to sustain yourself. So... That's another way of looking at it, but most people don't really. No, it's just, it. just, just self develop it, develop yourself. While we're on that right. topic, and we will end just now, is that Kosato's call for a nationwide strike recently to put the government in place, but unions and workers and companies coming in, do you think unions are doing the workers a favor or the country a favor? I know you don't get me wrong, unions have a job, they have a role, unions are needed. I'm not saying no. Correct, correct. But in their stance of what they're doing, if I was a country, if I was a kind of a company overseas wanting to come to invest in this country or whatever, and I see the labor unrest and I see that, I'm saying, hello, hold on. In fact, even now, when I want to go into certain businesses, I'm looking at the labor involved. And I stay away from labor intensive work because I'm going to have problems. I, I don't want to get into I'm going to, I know I'm going to have shit. Casey, while you're on that one, look, I, I, let, let me tell you, you're not alone there. Even myself, I always think, you know what? Once there's human element, there's human fact that you must know, trouble with you. Mind you, I, I've never mentioned any specific race, but I'm just talking in general. Once there's so much human interference and human factor, then that's where trouble begins. Okay. Now, back, it, back to the issue of Kosatu. Well, I don't mind Kosatu fighting for the rights of the workers and, and all of that. But let's be frank and let's contextualize this thing. The timing. Look at look at the current situation economically right now. Look how we are suffering, particularly because of all these other unrest and billions of friends that have been lost. Mind you, look who's talking. Kosatu is in bed with the ruling party. We all yeah. know that. So uh, I, I really don't understand that because okay, let's put it this way. Mostly. Maybe it's the government workers that they are fighting for, and we all know that this current government is an ANC-led government. Effect. So, how do you become a comrade at night, and then uh, with your uh, with the employer, if I may put it that way, and then you come back during the day, we are with the worker. Yeah, that's number one. You know, number two, oh, number two, we find ourselves in in this situation because of the leadership, the same leadership that you are in bed. With. So. Uh, when have we actually realized that they are causing damage? Only now, when we are really, really, really down and out, was, we are suffering just now economically. You can all see we are trying to repeat. And then you come, and then you come with all these stories. I, I don't know, but I could be wrong in my analysis. No. I tend to be <laughs> you. Well, I'm glad you also, we, we're thinking on the same line and we have the same mindset. And uh, the Cosato strike that they called for last week, I think it was, yeah. Mm. The amazing thing which I couldn't understand was the strike was about putting pressure on government to stop retrenching in the SOEs, to stop budget cuts in the SOEs. But you're sleeping with the government. You, you, you telling me, it's like this. It's like me. I use the example. I'm sleeping with my wife, yeah. but I go tomorrow and tell my son he must do something to make his mother upset, whatever, because she's not doing something. But I'm sleeping in the bed with her. I can tell her myself. I can make it right but I'm going using my son to tell him you must go and do this thing outside. You must go break the fence because your mother will come and see it. Then she, is, am I right in that? You're sleeping with, no, the, with the government. You are there with the government when you're using the worker to go and do something as if you fight. To me, it's making it seem as if they're fighting for their rights. But meanwhile, they are. They sold. They, they sold the workers out a long time ago. My my version. Correct. My, my Correct. You see, Casey, uh, maybe how, how can I put this thing? You see, I'll tell you there are two things that, that are really, really killing our own uh, approach in this whole thing. Number one is this whole thing of loyalty, if I put it this way. Because, you see, uh, some people, this is how they look at it. They'll tell you, no, hey, maybe as a black person, it, 
it's like a scene to part ways with let's call it a ruling party these are our liberators and so on okay fair enough point taken i agree i'm not saying that apartheid was right it was never right it was wrong but the question you need to ask yourself that okay here we are right now these are the issues that we are facing currently those were the issues that we faced back then fair enough but now these are the issues that we are facing amongst all these candidates that are available and that they are out there this the, the, the one that we are willing to support and sustain are you getting maximum benefit as a citizen from their entire management i'll put it that are they utilizing your taxes efficiently and effectively if you can answer those questions i won't blame you if you, if you care yeah. but yeah. if the answer is opposite So What's your... what kills us are, are the emotions. It's, it's loyalty and emotions. Look, we, we tend to deposit loyalty and emotions where we do not necessarily have to look. The relationship between a voter and a political party, it's not like uh, two married people or something like that. Look, look at America, for example. There are no guarantees which party will, will take over. Because if the voters there, you are not doing the right thing, they fight. They employ someone else who's going to do the right job. And we are talking a first world country. So I think those are the type of things that we actually need to look at as well. Yep. So that's our whole system is uh, is, is not the right system. Um, let's just finish off with uh, your view on the election. Let, look, let me get to the let me get. I don't ask about the election. Let me ask you about the ANC. ANC twenty seven years have been the ruling party, as you said. People want to be loyal to the ANC. Still vote for the ANC. Correct. Obviously, twenty seven years they've done. I wouldn't say they haven't done anything. They could have done a lot more than they could have done. And that's a fact. People must understand things have been done. But whereas they could have done 60, 70 percent, they've done 20 percent. That's that Correct. they've done work, but not as much as they could have done. Um, so where how do you see the elections panning out? Do you see the EFF gaining a lot of support? Do you see DA losing support, gaining support, ANC catching hiding? Is how do you see it? We all all know till second of November, but in your mind and speaking to people, what, what do you think is going to happen? Good good question. Very interesting one, Casey. Look, the, the way I look at it, uh, we can all see that the ANC's house is on fire just now. I don't know if you've seen the MKs, they, they slept there. They were there. Yes, they yes. Close, the house and all of that. The two house, so, yeah. Look, the wheels are coming off. It's not something that I'm wishing for. It's something that is really that is out there. So on the basis of that, it is very clear to say that the NC will drop. The, the, the numbers are definitely going to drop. That, that, that's a fact. The sad reality is that the EFF, to me, it looks like it will pick up some body. I'll tell you why. I interact with a lot of people. I, I talk, I ask questions. They tell me more, most people who are disgruntled with the ANC, they are most likely, not all of them, but they are most likely to shift to the EFF. Whether they are jumping from uh, the front, well, from the Frying pen to the fire or the fire to the <laughs> frying pen. I don't know. Only future will tell. Yes, sir. Sure. In terms of the DA, I, I, I'll be pretty frank. I, it's very difficult to predict from where I'm sitting because the outlook of the DA currently it does not project particularly particularly in the leadership. It does not project the blackness. And I, I will say this because look, South African politics. I must say that. Somehow it's attached to individual and color. And for you to become a ruling party or to gain more votes and, and, and all of that, it's a fact that you must have strong black, uh, we must have a strong base of black supporters. That's a fact. But having said that, I encourage all the small parties to exist. I'll, I'll explain why I'm saying this. Maybe you are talking about your parties such as the Freedom Front Plus, the Minority Front, and all of these other small parties. I'll explain why. You see, it's very dangerous to live in a society where a, a certain sector of the society feel that they are not represented or their voice is not being heard. heard. Because that leads to people being uh, despondent, disgruntled. And rest, and, yeah. It's, it, it's natural, it's logical that once somebody tries option A and option A doesn't work, at some stage, they'll be bound to try option B. 
how that option B will turn out, we, we all know. Because sometimes if you try to engage, Casey, naturally, some, sometimes you know these things, you try to engage, you try to do this, you try to do that, and no one is lending a listening ear to you, it's very easy to become violent as, a, as another option. I'm not saying that it should be happening. So what I'm saying is that it's good that they exist. It strengthens the democracy. Particularly, you see, the danger is that, and you can look everywhere else in the world, it's very dangerous to have a party that is, a, let me call it two-thirds majority. Because once, how they call it, absolute power corrupts. So once you've got total control, then you're not worried about Casey, you're not worried about whatever you say, my friend. And that, that, that's a, when, when I told people that uh, since last year or the year before, I was saying I'm I'm grateful for the DA. I said, I'm a DA, the racist party. I said, but the DA has been the strongest opposition in this country. The DA has made sure the ANC doesn't get a two-thirds majority. And if they did get a two, then we were screwed good and proper. So we have to give the DA the credit that's due. They were keeping the ANC in line in parliament. I mean, Zuma is before the courts because the DA 10 years ago were pushing all the charges against him. So I believe for a strong democracy, we need a strong opposition. We have to have, Absolutely. even, if, even if, I, if I have a party, let's say I'm an ANC supporter, or let's say I'm a DA supporter, the DA comes into power. I believe the opposition, I will vote for the opposition, in fact, in a way to make sure the party is kept on its toes. Otherwise, as you said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Then we are, then we are doomed. You see, Casey, another thing is that uh, once, okay, let's say for argument's sake, hypothetically speaking, uh, the ANC in the Tewini Metro maybe probably gets 42%. I'm just throwing that as an example. Maybe DA gets 23%, maybe the EFF got, maybe gets 12 or 13 or whatever, the IFP 18, whatever the case may be. There, there is no absolute win. Then reason will prevail because they will sit down around the table, they'll put their heads together. Uh, whoever decides to align himself or herself with it will be based on reason, as opposed to party loyalty and so on, because all these figures are coming from different parties. That's how I, I, I think democracy gets strengthened. Because reason prevails that because no one has got absolute power, no one is calling the short game. Everyone realizes or recognizes that they need each other. That's how I look yeah, at it. And I think I think for us in Itokwini, that's what's going to happen in this election. I hope it does. That's going to be a big shift in power. Not one party is going to come out, but they're going to have to force to be talking with each other from coalitions to be able. And, and, and I think for us as a people, that might be a better way to go because all have to start working together to bring out the best. So I think that might work out best for us as, as, as a people. Correct. But you see, what I'm hoping for during those uh, coalition talks because you see sometimes uh, in, in, in such arrangements money is do exchange underneath the table some parties <laughs> yeah. have bought it, 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 it affects so they'll take reason they'll pull it aside they'll, they'll get into bed with this one because some money some money is exchanged there underneath the table i hope that doesn't happen another thing casey i don't know what's your view on this one generally uh, there is this school of thought that says coalition governments are not good because uh, stability because of the issue of stability i don't know what your, what your take on that one no no look we <laughs> coalition is never good um but we are in a situation where we're taking the lesser evil or or seeing how can that work out what's our alternative yeah. having having the absolute power and we've done that so now yeah. we have to work with the coalition and see how does that work out like you said we tried option a option a option a it's got us nowhere Let's try the option B. See how it works out. We don't know. We have to play it out and see how it works. Yeah. The, the only thing I'm praying for and hoping for is that no one shooting that whole coalition thing is going to start ch changing sides because it's got bought this side and all of that. Let's hope. But look, it, it, it will be very good that we, from now henceforth, we get the coalition couple. Yeah. Because no. let's That's... face it. Okay. Let's face it. The ANC is not going to dramatically reduce drop maybe to a point where it gets 24 you know change is gradual but i'm almost certain that it will be below the 50 percent mark yeah no no for me the anc is still in power for the next two elections at least i was saying three but i believe two i don't think they're going to lose power i think they'll still be by the way i'm going to make i'm going to make a statement here and you were saying this earlier on about the da and all that 
I believe that South Africa, the only party to run this country is the ANC, but in its true form, and a black governed party to govern the majority black people. I can't see a uh, lily white uh, party governing the country. I think we'll be we have more unrest and more instability. It won't work, first, in my, my humble opinion. So we, yeah, you could say. How about, okay, look, I, I'm just saying, how about a party that, for, for example, Action SA, that is the party I see as an inclusive party uh, representing all South Africans across the spectrum, and that six, or that, or rather, that commits to professionalize uh, the public sector as opposed to this whole cadre deployment and political rhetoric and all of that. Well, action SA good, but the same, but you can see action SA as much as it's inclusive. Um, we have the the black leadership coming through, which is which is what what appeals with the appeal of the majority, like the Makosi there. Or the Kosa lady, the uh, Elman Mashaba. See, it has a, like, apart from the DA that has a sort of a white face, Action SA has a black face. So we're still in that sort of mode that a black, almost a black people, black party run, more black people run the country. That's why Action SA would, would, would do well in, in, in that capacity. And I wouldn't mind that, uh, saying that. Um, look, Mario Renja, uh, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. What an interesting conversation uh, to chat with you. Thank you so much for staying on my platform, not running away in the early parts, and it allowed us to become uh, um, Facebook friends. And hopefully, as I said to uh, um, the guy yesterday, <coughs> Toko, TK, that we must meet up and uh, share some stories, some cultural differences, and learn a bit more about each other. Correct. <coughs> Absolutely, uh, Casey. I think that's the way to go. That's the only way we can build a positive future. So thank you for, so much for having me on your program in your platform and thank you so much to your viewers as well no thanks next time there's something that comes up that needs your input and your discussion we'll definitely get you on have a wonderful evening and love to your family thank you so much have a lovely evening as well same with your viewers thank you so uh, much Casey. yes bye uh, there we go that was uh Madulenja. what a lovely conversation with uh, Madulenja, who was on my platform uh since the days of the unrest or just after the unrest following they decided to stay on uh, Ash is very interesting tonight as well. Thank you very much for watching. We've been over an hour. Thank you to Madulenja. Uh, I'm just making new mates as we go along. The trolls have disappeared. The trolls got no more shit to say. I uh, can't come on and talk their shit yet. The good guys are coming to the front now. And uh, yeah, very interesting interview. Lovely to put a face to the name. Uh, yeah, bless you, Madulenja. Madulenja has been, Kritika knows Madulenja has been on the platform for a while. Adil said, awesome show. Keep well, sweet dreams. Right. Have a good evening, you guys. It's still mighty hot here in KZN. Um, the wind came up in the afternoon, which was good, but it was a hell of a hot day. I think, I'm not sure of the weather tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm going to be in uh, FNB, starting on a bank account for the Phoenix Accused. Um, I, was, I spent two hours at the bank to start internet banking out with another signatory. It's just a lot of work. A lot, a lot of work involved in that. But I'm exhausted now. Uh, thank you so much for watching. We've reached the end of the program. So say your good nights. <laughs> Yusuf says, now you can have a Jameson and a joint. Ah, yeah. Let's keep at it that way. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, by the way, next week, Tuesday, the DA, Democratic Alliance in the House. On Monday, next week, we talk to Naren Ganesh. He's an independent candidate on the political desk. Naren Ganesh, uh, he's an independent candidate. He is the one who took Julius Malema or taking Julius Malema to the Constitution or the Equality Court. Uh, on Tuesday, we're going to sit with the DA. Nicole Graham from the DA joins us on Tuesday night. Wednesday night, I think I'm talking to somebody from a group in Phoenix. Um, I can't get the name. Thursday, we're going to be talking to uh, Shando Teron, who specializes in marriage. He's a marriage, divorce lawyer, and custody issues. If you, if you have a child, children, custody laws, father's rights, He's the man to speak to next week, Thursday. Power pack lineup. Uh, tomorrow night we'll be a sundown a session. Non alcoholic drinks. Ay, 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 ay. We'll see Kritika if we do that. Um, in the meantime, you guys have a fantastic evening. Remember to always keep it. Mother. The name is Casey Carl. I'm out.